All right, hello everybody. Right now, Brady and I are out here on the marsh. So the marsh is the natural habitat of the diamondback terrapin. As you can see out in front of us, there's several different types of vegetation. Uh, right here, I'm standing in something called the Spart uh, Spartina grass, specifically Spartina alterniflora, a salt marsh cord grass that is very common in salt marshes and usually lines like these banks here, and these canals that come in. As of right now, it's low tide. So that's why you can see a lot of the detritus or that uh, very organic rich mud exposed. Uh, as you can see, you can actually see how it kind of dips down right towards the cliffs. So that's where it, it, uh, it converts over from the grasses over to the water. Right now that it's low tide and there's not any water here, you're not going to find terrapins in this location specifically. You're going to find them more out towards the bay. Uh, in a bit, we're going to do a quick walk down there and see if we can get a more uh, a little bit more of a filled area. But yeah, here we have the Spartina grasses. We also have the Phragmites back here. So Phragmites australis australis is an invasive species. There is a native species of Phragmites. However, the invasive tends to be much taller and due to its ability to grow much taller, uh, it has the advantage to outcompete the native. So that's why you see this uh, Phragmites stand that's anywhere from 8 to 14 feet tall. A little bit more in the distance, you can also see the little uh, little trees in the background. They look kind of like little Christmas trees. Those are eastern red cedars. They're actually uplands trees, but they do have a salt tolerance. So that's why as long as the area is inundated, they can survive in marsh environments because they are not fantastic competitors, but due to the environment, uh, it's a great habitat for them and also provides great habitat for a lot of uh, species in the marsh. And there as well, you saw a red-winged blackbird fly off on top of that tree right there. All right, so on our way over more towards the bay, we actually found this little guy. And this is an eastern box turtle. So he is not an aquatic turtle. So if you find one of these, these guys, you never want to put him in the water. <laughs> um, but they are herbivorous, so they do eat like berries, leaves. Um, one important thing about these guys, like if you see them, obviously if they're on the road, you want to move them off the road, but you don't want to move them a great distance from where you find them because they do have a very small like home range. So if you do take them away from their home and they're lost, they're going to spend the rest of their lives looking for that home. And you're going that puts a great deal of stress on them, especially if they go in the wrong direction or they don't find it. So you always want to be very careful with these guys. Generally when you see wild animals, you don't want to be uh, inter interacting with them too much. Um, but with these guys specifically, obviously, um, so big case where you really want to like intervene with a terrapin or a turtle is going to be with, like if they're crossing the road. Either best case, you just stop and let the turtle cross the road, or um, you just help them in the direction that they're going. Other than that, though, if you see turtles, you shouldn't be moving them out of their habitat because, uh, especially with these guys, you can really uh, you can hurt them. Okay, so here we are in a more inundated part of the marsh. Um, there you can see a goal flying above. And Steven's going to talk about transition zones. All right, so here's actually a great example of the marsh transitional zones. So the more water tolerant species of Spartina alterniflora that you're going to find along the water right here, a lot spikier, especially stepping on it, it does. Like you can definitely feel it. And as you move a little bit more uh, further in, you can see that this, like, this uh, grass it looks like it's laying down. That's a different kind of Spartina grass, known as Spartina patens. Easy way to remember it, you can just pat it down. Um, if we go a little bit further on, we can find uh, marsh shrubs, such as marsh elder. So marsh elder does not uh, prefer to be inundated as much as the Spartina grasses, so that's why you find it a little bit further away and a little bit more elevated. Then, finally, in the back is when you're going to find the eastern red cedars, which are an upland species, and due to the very uh, sandiness of the soil, very well drained, um, however, it's also very salty, so because, due to the salt content, that's why it's able to compete so well in this environment. And throughout this entire area, you can also see the, uh, the Phragmites uh, interweaving between all the plants. All right, so here we have another common marsh species known as the ribbed mussel. So these aren't the mussels that you're going to have at like a like for dinner at a restaurant. They're a much more marsh-specific species. Uh, over there, you can also see that they line the banks of the marsh and they help reinforce and stabilize the sediments so the marsh doesn't weaken as easily. So it is a, it is a mutual relationship 
where it provides the marsh provides habitat for the rib mussels and the rib mussels reinforce the marsh. Right, we're further, a little bit further into the marsh, and as you can see out in the water, there's little ripples uh, flying out. Those are little uh, bait fish or juvenile fish uh, just eating larvae. Uh, the majority of these larvae are actually mosquito larvae. So this does actually help control mosquito populations in the area. So not only are marshes important as uh, a unique habitat, but they also help to regulate mosquito populations, pest populations, and they're also considered a nursery for a lot of species. So a lot of these like little bait fish that we see um, are also juvenile fish for larger species that are going to be found out in the bay, uh, things they are going to be like fish for sport once they're much larger. There too. Here we see one of the holes for the fiddler crabs that live in the marsh. Kind of hard to zoom in here, but you can see a uh, rather large fiddler crab here. And here's actually one of the claws that must have broken off from one uh, a while ago. But as you can see, that uh, some of the crabs here, they actually have one really large claw and one much smaller claw. So that's the example of one of the large claws. That's why they're called fiddler crabs too, because it kind of looks like they're playing the fiddle. So here we actually see two really awesome marsh birds. So first here, kind of blending up with the logs, a tricolor heron. He is one of her awesome herons here. So you can see he has a black tip to his bill. He is stalking the water, and boom, he just you saw him just spear a fish. And then sitting atop this pillar right here is a tern. And terns are really cool because they essentially dive into the marsh. So I'll try to get a picture later, but they essentially seem like they're like floating in the air and then they just they just dive into the marsh. So if you see a bird just dive and spear a fish from the air, then that's probably a tern. Also, you can see some crows and some swallows and some red-winged blackbirds flying around the marsh. So the marsh actually has a ton of different bird species as well as all of the other animals we're going to cover. Another quick note about birds, these towers you see in the marsh are actually osprey towers, and ospreys like to nest in these, and we don't see any right now, but if you look with binoculars, you can sometimes see ospreys feeding their young. That's just always really cool. They were threatened a while ago by a pesticide that was used called DDT, but that has been outlawed since then, so they're making a comeback. Here you can actually see two ospreys using the osprey nest that was put for them. Here we actually have a tern flying above the marsh. So you can see him scanning the water for fish, and we will see if we can get him to dive down. There we just saw a tern dive, finally cooperated. So here's another one of our wading birds. Here is actually a snowy egret. So he is related to the tricolored heron before, or not related, but they're very similar. So we'll see he does a very similar stalking. You can also see when he flaps his wings, he has those very yellow feet, and that distinguishes him from a great egret, which is a uh, another very similar bird species. You also hear some swallows calling in the distance, and over here as well, kind of blocked by the tree, but there is a mute swan. We'll probably get a better, oh, there we go. And there's also some willets calling in the distance. They are rather shy, so we'll probably find them, um, well, we probably won't find them because they're uh, kind of hidden, but they like to chill in the long grasses of the marsh. Do it, everyone. Okay, so here we are at an area where the marsh transitions into the bay, as you can see. And right here is a little herring gull, rather a large herring gull, eating one of his catches, which seems to be a fish. So you can see the circle of life happening right in front of us, folks. So we have different different species. The lot strand deer, right now it's very black or brown. It's actually um, eelgrass. However, when it's in the water and it's alive, it's very green and 
vibrant. Uh, we also have other, another species known as Ovalactuca or sea lettuce, which is actually an edible species and actually does look like a piece of lettuce that's in, in the bay. So there we have an example of Ovalactuca. battered, pushed back, and generally how the marsh would recover from this is the marsh, as the salt content increases on the other side, the marsh would then be building further back. But due to development and some roads, the marsh can't pierce through those roads. So unfortunately, once the marsh reaches its stopping point, it goes through a lot of stuff up. It's only left between the marsh and development. Once it reaches that area, unfortunately the marshes don't have Here we have mudduglux, so they're very common a little snail or mollusks, mollusk species in the marsh. So as you can see there's a little guy in there. So these guys are all over the marsh. See a couple of them moving in here. But they are also an important food source for a lot of the animals here, especially the birds. So but they are all over the marsh. Actually at first they do look like a lot of like a bunch of little pebbles along the marsh. Here you can see a tricolor heron and some willets actually hunting in the marshland out there. Right, so right there, we actually have a diamondback terrapin sticking its head up right out of the water. It's something that they do is called periscoping, so they'll leave their body submerged and their head popping out, so it's harder to find them, and so that way they're able to stay hidden but still see their surroundings. Here we have actually a terrapin just taking her head up out of the water. This is in the more creek area, but there we go. Well, thank you guys for watching our habitat video for the diamondback terrapin. We got to see some interesting flora and fauna. And again, my name is Steven Holmberg, and I'm here with... Hello, I'm Brady Nichols. And uh, I'll include some links at the end for you if you want to learn more about the marsh, more about Prado Terrapin, and uh, thanks for watching. Thanks guys.